welcome to Gen Friends. I'm your host, Sherry Hudson Passy from Carolina Girl Genealogy. We have got such a fun show for you tonight. We've got this wonderful panel. We've got Melissa Barker, our archive lady. Hi, Melissa. Hello, everybody. So good to have you here. We have got Laura Hedgecock from Treasure Chest of Memories. Hi, Laura. Hi, everybody. So good to have you here, too. You've been wedding dress shopping for your daughter-in-law. How fun that you're back. We've got Mary Kircherati from MKR Genealogy. Hi, Mary. Hi there. Good to have you back, too, from your travels and your things mm -hmm. you've been doing. And Shelly Murphy, our family tree girl. Hey, Shelly. Hey there. Glad to be Shelley, here tonight. Shelly never goes anywhere. She's always in the mountains of Virginia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, got... I just came back from Charleston. <laughs> I know. I wish I could have met you down there. And we have got Dan Earl, our family history guy. Hey, Dan. Hey, how's it going? Good. Good to have you here. I am so excited for our special guest tonight. We have with us Nika Smith, and she just did the most wonderful, which is it a movie document, documentary? What, 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 what do you call it for ancestry? It was the most wonderful. It's about a half hour long. Nika, what, what's the official term for for what this was it's about 30 minutes yeah it's a short short film just a short film yeah it's so right, wonderful just it, yeah just a short film I just want to make sure I called it the right thing but um it is absolutely the most amazing thing that I have ever seen in a long long time and so we had to get you on and it's called a a dream delivered the lost letters of Hawkins Wilson and and what it is is um some letters that were found or a letter that was found in the Freeman Bureau's records um, of a, a formerly enslaved person looking for his family connections for his family after after the war, after emancipation. And that happened a lot. They would write letters trying to find their family. So how 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 did this all come to be? How did the letters get found? And then how did Ancestry find it? And how did it become a movie? Like all the things we want to know. <laughs> <laughs> she's like she's like cross all the cross all the teams dot all the eyes. Yeah. Um, so one thing that a lot of people don't really realize is that the letter um, from Hawkins Wilson is one of the letters from the bureau that has been published probably the most. Um, it's been in textbooks. Um, in fact, if you go to the National Archives website, they will they actually have the scan of the original on there you know the yellowed copy mm -hmm. um and so again it's just because that's the thing it's, it's arresting he very plainly talks about these things that are just you know when those of us who are alive now are are listening to or even reading or even hearing you know just this letter it you're just kind of taken aback by just how mm -hmm. clear plain and like straight and blunt he is about just the reality of of enslavement and um so it's it's been featured a lot and so um you know last year in in august i don't know why people why do we why do i interchange august with april i know i'm not the only person that does that but anyway <laughs> it's all good must be something in like our the right must be something they both sometimes. start with a <laughs> <laughs> right, but it must be some cortex thing because it's like one summer, one spring. Anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, last August, Ancestry brought on um, the Freedmen's Bureau collection with 3.5 mm -hmm. million records um, within it. Recently expanded it. Um, I, you know, any place I get the opportunity to talk about that, I will because yes. um, you know there were 91,000 more records were added that were like registers uh, of employment another 62,000 records that were actually a part of the Freedmen's Bank collection that was recently added. So the collection is still being refreshed, even though it was released last year. Um, so with that, you know, wanting to focus on something that um, really just showed what the Bureau could do in, in mm -hmm. records. So, you know, and I think those of us who are really into genealogy, um, we all have tried, or at least this is, this is the exercise I know that me and Shelly do a lot can we find these people yes. who are in these records, even if they're not related to us, right? Like, we don't mm -hmm. care. Like, we mm -hmm. just want to see, you know, our, our me and Shelly's favorite ancestor, this woman is nowhere near related to either one of us, but she's a, this 100-year-old woman getting rations in St. Landry Parish, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And the first time we saw her in those records, we were just blown away by a 100-year-old woman getting rations in 1767. Wow. Like, 
or you know, you know, what I mean, 1867. Yes. So she's born in 1767. Yes. And you know, like that was a lot because you don't see enslaved people at all. <laughs> no. So, you know, so just like with that, again, this letter, it just it just sticks with you. And so um, even with like Miss Betsy trying to find her later on, that's really the process that was taken to try to find anyone connected to Hawkins and then also to really fulfill his dream to be reconnected with his family. Yes. And so um, instead of tracing from the present backward, we traced from the past forward to get yeah. uh, to the folks who were in the film. All right. I know everybody's got lots of questions, so I don't want us to talk over <laughs> each other. Who would like to go first? I'll go first. Sure. Um, I'd like to know how... How did you, Nika, get um, involved in this? Um, uh, I know a little bit about your background, but let us tell us about your journey to get to do such a wonderful project. So, yeah, so many people who may be watching pretty much know me from genealogy, but I don't think a lot of folks in genealogy know that I went to college for communications and journalism. That's mm -hmm. my bottom, you know, level. That's where I come to this as a genealogist, right? Like, so it's natural for me to write or to record or to, um, to take pictures, do all of that, because that's what I went to school for. And genealogy was a natural fit because, you know, reporters at their heart are really just nosy like us, right? <laughs> we want to get down to the bottom of things. Um, and that coupled with, um, you know, some of the jobs that I had out of college, you know, one of the jobs that I had was basically doing like a, a work genealogy for doctors, you know, making sure that the individual who was going to operate on you had a license, completed medical school, did their internship and residency, not just completed it, but completed it with excellence, you know, that there were no time gaps in their work history, um, you know, that were longer than three months. Literally all the stuff that we think about as genealogists, I was doing that for doctors, to credential <laughs> doctors. So, and, and, and my coworkers would be like, how did you find, like, how did you know that hospital got the name changed? Well, call a near, call the one closest to it. Find the oldest person, you know, the person who's been working there the longest say, when did so-and-so change hands? Like, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and having to cover your steps. So it's literally, it's the same thing. It literally is the same thing. So that, that, you know, journalism, doing that in college, graduating with that degree, working in medical staff credentialing, those both came together to basically get me to the place I'm at now. And then um, I've had a really amazing relationship with Ancestry, you know, serving as a consultant with them over the last five years. Um, it's been one of the best things. I mean, from, from this film to um, you know, Uncle Al getting, getting to meet Al Roker and hanging out on the Today <laughs> Show, um, you know, to um, one, even one thing we did some death sides at a conference and I got a chance to be Rosa Parks niece. Um, mm. Like there's so many like just stories of like things that have happened. Like, you know, and I forget until someone reminds me like one, one time, no, actually when the Today Show happened. I don't even know if you remember this, Shelly. But I thought about it when I was here in this room. I was staying overnight in New York and I, I like the boroughs. Like I like to be with the people, you know, Times Square <laughs> is too much for me. Like I, I walk through Times Square and I'm like, who is paying, who's paying the electricity? Like, this is just so excessive and like American. So, so I'm saying it's too much. So I'm, I'm staying downtown and I checked in super late and the lady at the front desk was like, so yeah, we ran out of rooms. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I got in at like midnight. Are you kidding me? And she's like, so we only have like one room left. It's the presidential suite. And I said, what? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, you're only going to be here overnight. So, you know, and so I, she gave me the instructions on how to get to this place. And I was like, Lord, please don't let nobody. Like, I'm thinking they're going to come and take me out of the room, right? Because I'm not supposed to be there. You know, I'm supposed to have just a king size bed. That's it. Like, that's it. But I get up there and it is, I, I have never seen a hotel room this big in my entire life. Like, even still. And, and it was hilarious. Like my mom goes, if that was me, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd sleep in a different room. And like that, I just have like crazy, just crazy like memories like that. Like, yeah, that one time I got to do that. It's been, it's been awesome. It really, really has. And I, again, and I forget stuff until, you know, oh, memory starts to come up and then I'm like, Right. And again, like this little embassy suites room reminded me of the fact that I got that <laughs> for like a day. I don't know why, but yeah, it was great. It's been, 
it's been an awesome, it's been an awesome relationship though. So that's a long-winded way of saying, yeah, it's been a long-standing thing, but um, but the stuff that I do with ancestry, it spans a gamut from just tried and true genealogy research, like you know, like we're used to, to mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes I do Instagram lives or Facebook mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I I do interviews with the press. Um, you know, again, conferences, it's just, it's all over. I love it because it, it, every day is not the same. Um, and, you, you know, and when Krista people ask me what I do. Go ahead, Shelly. We do, we do. Her, Krista Callen, Barefoot, yes. Genealog yes. Barefoot yes. Genealogist, also with Ancestry, the two of them do things. And, and you can share the one you guys did at Roots Tech one year. We did. So oh. yeah, so in fact we in fact we did a we actually did a tag team um webinar for in for NGS where we didn't like we had like no slides. Like I was like, oh, how are we gonna do this? She's like, well, you know, we don't wanna, you know, like we like let's do something different. We had so much positive feedback on that loud. session. Like I can't even explain it to you. Everyone was like, you guys are so awesome. That well, she's my cousin. We that's how, really I was gonna like, say you she I, is, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And we know, we know exactly how we're related. Um, and like, we just, that's the thing. The, the plan is to do more stuff like that. Cause we just have so much fun together. Like it yeah. just, we just really do. I love, I love me some Chris McCallan. <laughs> we all do. We all do. So who, who brought the story to Ancestor? Did, Ancestor, did they bring it to you and say, we need to do they, this? They, they, well, that's the thing. So, so the, the, the story production team um, is a team that I work with all the time. Um, Lisa LZ, that's my other boo. I have a lot of boo's ancestry, but Lisa, I love Lisa. Um, Lisa was the person um, that really was like, we've got to tell this. Like, she really was like the steam and the engine. Um, and then, of course, there's, you know, there's other people inside, you know, who are, you know, the ones that have to go and say, hey, we want to do something like this, you know. And um, it was it was definitely a team effort, you know, because, you know, one of the things that that we only had 29 minutes. And so there are aspects yeah. of the story that ge that the genealogists are like, well, what about well, what about, you know, yes. it's like, we would we would need roots. We would need a mini series for multiple right. days in order for us to like, I mean, again, if you think about roots, it's one enslaved man from Africa. Right. It's his family. Right. right, like it's not fifty people from that. It was only one man. So, yeah. so with Hawkins, right? So with Hawkins, you know, one of the things about that story, you know, the letter did not go to the right place. And mm -hmm. even though it had all of those incredible details yes. with counties and yeah. cities and people, that part will throw you off. Mm -hmm. And there, there are other folks who have tried to track down descendants mm -hmm. and and fa family members. But if you walked in and you really held very tightly to the Caroline County, mm -hmm. you would never, you would never make the inroads. And and the other part that I would say that's something that a lot of folks don't know is that this family is stinking huge. Uncle Jim's side is prolific. Like <laughs> it, they they are never they do they don't ever have to worry about nobody there being no descendants. There are so <laughs> many people on that side of the family. It's it is it's crazy. Um and the other thing I'll say is that because of the film, I've had so many people reaching out to me mm -hmm. who whose ancestors were enslaved by the same family, if not the mm -hmm. same man that that uh that you know that that had mm -hmm. the debt and was auctioned off, mm -hmm, you know, had, mm -hmm. had uh, Hawkins auctioned off. And so um, there's a bunch of folks, again, that were either enslaved by him or the family, and they're doing the work trying to figure out, like, well, are we related to him oh, too? Yeah. Or, um, you know, were we like plantation kin? And mm -hmm. and I, I, even, I even have that story. I'm related to Tally's somehow um, in the same exact counties in Virginia and North Carolina. Huh. Um, so, so that's like, that's again, it, it's TBD, <laughs> TBA, <laughs> um, you know, we could go on forever. Yeah. Laura, so, you've got a question. Yeah. And that's a great segue to my question because in the letter, I don't know how much we're not allowed to give away, but in the letter, he's looking for his sister. And I wanted to know if you knew her outcome, was she alive at the time he was searching for her and where did she end up? And I know you can't do a whole roots during gin friends, but <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the that's the thing. Um, that's TBA. 
because, you know, you do any level of slavery era research, especially in this situation, we're talking about the 1830s, okay? So, you know, having a, a census to rely on that is, you know, with households listed, you know what I mean? Even that small mm -hmm. of a thing, right, that you get in 1850, that can totally shift stuff because, you know, when the sale took place to when 1850, that's, that's years. The reason why I say that is because let's say Guilford Talley dies, the estate rolls to his wife. She's in a household with her son. We aren't even going to see her on the census mm -hmm. to even be able to count right. her unless she lives to 1850. Same thing with some with any of the other slaveholders who were named. You have to factor that stuff in, you know. And I and I would imagine, um, you know, I, I think I can pretty much say this, Jelly. I would imagine would agree. Researching the formerly enslaved, um, the roadblocks that you hit it where women are not documented by name. Sometimes it's very similar to enslaved people. And you're just mm -hmm. really hoping that there's some evidence, something that's going to lead back to someone. And it's, it's just, it's, his, it's record sort of erasure. You know, it's the unfortunate thing. And so with Jane, um, you have to remember there, there were other sisters, Matilda, several mm -hmm. sisters were listed in the letter and then also were included in um, the deed of gift that Thomas Talley had to his children, where it lists Gatha and Hawkins and his sisters, you know, it's still TBA. You know, even in a state like like uh, Virginia, you know, Hawkins is a great name because it's like not very common, but right. there are a lot of Matildas, there are a lot of Janes. Yes. So mm -hmm. how do you know which one is right? And you don't want to sink your teeth into like, yes, this is her. Right. And there's two. <laughs> You know, yeah. and, and slavery records are so varied. You know, you'll for every one that you have that has the age of, of an enslaved person, you'll have mm -hmm. a bunch that don't. don't. And you'll have to kind of adjust, right, based on the value of the enslaved person to kind of assume how old they are. But the very young and the very old are priced very similarly. So then it's mm -hmm. like, how would you know it's on one end or the other unless you find another document to like confirm or reject? So there, there's a lot of variables. But it's not impossible. That's mm -hmm. one of the that's the, one of the promises of the movie. Of yeah, the I film, noticed is you, that it's you not really impossible. you really said that clearly in the movie mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or the short film. And at the time when people were going to the Freedmen's Bureau, how many were actually successful in finding their relatives through the Freedmen's Bureau? I mean, percentage wise, it was wise. a very small number. Yeah, yeah, it was a small number. I mean, it really can't even be quantified. Um, you know, that it's it's almost like, you know how we have quote unquote exact figures on the number of enslaved based on the slave schedules, like mm -hmm. 1860 and 1850. Even that is off, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, so so I, so I for an exact percent, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you know- No, Dr. I just Gates wanted a rough it. idea. Like, yeah, was- It's low. It's very low. And even, even if you control for it by also bringing in, in the information wanted ads that were run in newspapers mm -hmm. where people were seeking reconnection with their family members, whether it's a, uh, you know, just a, a, a county city paper or, you know, things like with the Christian recorder that were faith-based papers that would print the ads for free. And then they would read them over the pulpit on Sundays in hopes that somebody that was listening would actually find a, a family member. It, you know, the Freedmen's Bureau was one means, the, the information wanted ads were another. And then, you know, it, it's just, this is one story of so many. Like it's, you know, it's, it's yeah, there's a lot to be, there's a lot in this space. Mary, you have a question? Yeah, um, so Nika, you just talked about um, trying to infer age from, the dollar value. Um, I have um, enslavers in my ancestry and I have a will that lists people by name and a value. Um, and, and how do you figure out those numbers? I mean, what are the references that I could go to to try to figure that out? One of the primary sources that I've used, and, and honestly, I feel like it completely transformed uh, my slavery era research, was a book called The Price of a Pound of Flesh by mm -hmm. um, a professor named Dana Ramey Berry. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard read at times because you're just like, you know, it, it takes you to the courthouse steps, like the movie, mm -hmm. like the film did, where you just like, you want, you want something to kick or punch. Like you're just 
like mm-hmm. you're like, how the heck did this happen? That the book will definitely do that. But one of the things that it did teach me was, you know, how enslaved people were monetized, like in terms of a child, um, a baby, you know, an, an enslaved child, $100, $150. That's really how you know the age of a child versus if you swing all the way to the other end, if you've got somebody over 60 years old, they might have a value that low as well or around $200. Um, so it's the polar opposites. It's a very young child and a, and a very old person and very old is relative or elderly is relative, meaning someone who can't, you know, pick a bunch of cotton at the speed of a, of a 17 year old. And then you really enslave people peak in their early or they start to go up in their, their late teens or like mid to late teens. And the value keeps going up and up and up and up. And then right about after age 30, it starts to go down. And so um, if you see an enslaved person with the with an enslavement value of like a thousand or two thousand dollars, usually like in anything upwards of that, they have usually have a skilled trade. Mm-hmm. Like there's something about them that is very valuable that would price them that high. Now, if you're in a state like Kentucky, Kentucky's enslaved garnered high values pretty much all the time because of those skilled trades. And that actually sort of translated over into uh, the Reconstruction era and the Freedmen's Bureau with those individuals who were in Kentucky getting paid more through labor contracts than any other state. Hmm. When you look at all the other states um, in terms of the rates that folks were getting paid. So yeah, uh, Dr. Ramey's book, Ramey Berry's book is like seminal. Um, I remember when it came out and we were all reading it and like angry and, it's, it's you know, she talks it again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like right, I've right. got it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, this right. I, this one estate inventory that I had, it listed a number of people at like nine nine hundred or um, you know five hundred, um, and the last one was a woman named Rilla, and the value was worth nothing but a maintenance. Oh. It just that was a just a gut oh. punch for me seeing that. Oh. I mean it. There's no value. So that, that, you have to pay to support this person. I mean, yeah. it was just right. was so hard to right. see. Right. And and to that point, when you see that, they'll let you know this is the elderly person yeah. in that space. They are there. They're going to watch the children while the other people work because the children can't be out picking cotton until they're taught how to do so efficiently. So they will be watching toddlers and things like that. And then depending on the state, you know, it it could it would be put on the slaveholder to pay to care for that elderly person. You couldn't just say, "Oh, well, you aren't making me any money anymore, so I'm going to kick you out on the street, and you don't have any, you don't have a place to live, you don't have food, you're not clothed." You couldn't in some states. You could not do that legally. You had to take care of your enslaved until they died. So yeah. that that you know what I mean. But yeah, so for yeah, them, it's like, yeah. oh, hi. Right. Yeah. So, so, oh yeah, my son's not going to get her because you know what I mean? Or, or yeah. there's sometimes provision is made. My son is going to get her because she raised him. Mm-hmm. So even though there is, may not necessarily be a value they, a lot, sometimes you'll see a state where the kid, the kids, you know, the, the enslaved elderly person gets to pick who they want to live with hmm. um, be, as sort of, I guess you would consider it a good gesture, you know, cause they're at the end of their life and they could choose who they want but it's mm-hmm. still the barbaricness of enslavement sure. regardless. I've Absolutely. seen that in wills. When it's mm-hmm. left and they say that the, the house servant or whoever it is, it gets to pick who they want to go if something happens and this, that, and the other, you know. Um, Michelle, you had a question. So go ahead. This is a good time for you. Yeah, I, want, I have a, co- a couple comments. Um, first, I'll follow up on something that uh, Mary said, talking about the value and, and you guys know True Lewis and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and just like what Mary just was commenting on the one that she looked at in the state paper, True Lewis and I was looking at one and there was a value of 50 cents. Oh. And we have a whole list of all these different values and it hit both of us at the same time. And it was just like, I could get the 300. I could get the 1200. I get the 900. But what? is 50 cents, you know, Mm -hmm. and I'm I'm making that comparison to thinking like, you know, Mary looking at the same thing. 
And I know Virginia is one of those states because it was a 1705 act. They had to take care of them. They could not sell them and they couldn't put them in the field. If this they was could not work, Lunenburg they, County, they, Virginia. My people, they had so. to take them. And, and what was surprising was to see in the 1870 census, you would have a couple, an elderly black couple in the census you'll see in a white household. And again, that would have just came. They could have let them go after that or whatever. But at that point, I, I don't want to really use the term that that's family, but that's now family. You know, they've been there and had to take care of them. But I'm um, coming back to um, Hawk and Wilson's in the comment was in the Freedmen Bureau, the things, and like I said, we're in there all the time. Mm -hmm. But in his letter, the details, the specifics, yes. who was where and when and what and neighbors. But Nika, I want to make sure I understand. And I have watched that film <laughs> three times. <laughs> well enough already. Right, three times. He yep. was a child. Yeah. And this is going on his memory <sighs> as a child. And, and I don't know. If, and again, I get that because I've watched it three different times. And, and the reason I watch it is because understanding, because of what I do, I want to be able to make sure I'm catching the benefit of the information that's on there. Am I hearing that voice? But that was a child. Mm -hmm. Of course, the bureau agent is helping him that wrote the letter. But again, this is the memories this man had as a child yeah. of his sisters and where they went. To it's, me, it was amazing. That, mm -hmm. that was the mm -hmm. gut wrenching thing. Is like, how do you remember that? Yeah. Was he like six or seven? I can't remember. Was it six or seven? He was years six. Old? Yeah, he was mm -hmm. six or seven when he was when he was auctioned off. Right, and and the that, trauma, that, that that's the another trauma, reason, probably right. Yeah. Right. Well, and the other thing, I mean, again, you look at how enslaved people have been categorized and, and talked about over yeah. time, right? They're yeah. stupid. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're illiterate, right? Because they couldn't learn how to read or write. It was, it was illegal. You know, the, all these things around their, their mental capacity, which we know is not true. They were not this sofa I'm sitting on, mm -hmm. you know, while they were relegated to that class, they, that was not, that was not who they were. And you know, the other thing you have to reckon with, too, is a lot of enslaved people came from Africa already literate in reading yes. and writing. No. And, and, and it's right. Again, like literally, you know, I've seen records um, that are part of the trash papers where it's literally an entire the first book of the Quran written in Arabic by an enslaved person who was supposed to be illiterate. Mm -hmm. You know, like, come wow. on, like we and, and so, yes, there's trauma associated. But you have to remember, it's like, you know, the first time you've ever had a snowball, <laughs> you know, if you were ever in New Orleans <laughs> or like the first time you've ever had a beignet or like, you know, Cafe yeah. Olea, Cafe Du Monde, or like the first time you ever see the sunset over the Mississippi. Yeah. You know, there are certain things that are etched in your memory sure. that, that don't require your phone to remember or don't require you to write them down, but you just commit them to memory. Mm -hmm. And for him, that was, I mean, again, you have to think about the, the, the only threads of hope that he had in his life was that was again either on earth and the by and by he was going to be reconnected with his family mm -hmm. either by his own doing or because you know the the effort to do so on earth was not going to take place you know but uh, again you, the other thing that that letter does that i also want those of us who are in the genealogy community to be aware of is it really really reinforces what those of us who who consistently research the enslaved know enslavement was familial not just at the part of the enslaved family, but also the slave holding family. The names that were mentioned with regard to where his siblings were, these are all individuals who are related to the original slave holding family mm -hmm. or who are a part of, of their fan club. You know, so this, this, right. this kind of individualistic way that we've been approaching genealogy where it's my family, my direct people, where DNA has really blown that up oh, and absolutely. said, you can't just focus on your line, right? Like you've got to look at the other people. When you research enslaved folks, you also have to research in community because otherwise you're going to miss seeing mm -hmm. when an enslaved person was, you know, bequeathed in a will, 
Adidas right. gift. If you don't know who the players are, then you'll miss it. Exactly. Real quick, um, how much notice do you think the family would have had that that Hawkins was going to be sold? Do you think it would have just come one day or do you think there would have been, like he mentioned that his sister had said, we'll meet together in heaven. I was just wondering if the family maybe had a chance to prepare him, like you remember where we are. These are some, I mean, I just wonder, um, or did it just happen one day and they had no idea it was coming? I think they did. I mean, again, you know, you got to go back to to enslaved people. Listen, think about the Underground Railroad. How in the world did that work with a bunch of people who could not read or write? Yes. And and really no and no paper trail to be like, hey, we've got these ledgers, right? Like there's there are a few things that remain. Here's a map. But I say that. <laughs> that's what I'm saying, right? But I but I say that to say, yeah. You have to think, who's working in the house, right? Because whoever those house slaves are, they are overhearing conversations. Everything. Mm -hmm. the, the hearing is, the hearing is, is peak, like, oh, oh, he got money problems. Okay, mm -hmm. let me put the word out that, that some folks might get sold because then it's, it's a couple of things. It's, I'm going to wait it out or it's, I'm not going to wait and see, let me self-emancipate myself because I'm not trying to be sold away from my family. Mm -hmm. It's it's you know where there was a, where there was an apparent um, lack of being able to make a decision or advocate for yourself. There were ways that enslaved people worked around that system, and so it, there is. It's very possible that someone in his family knew, you know. And again, because mm -hmm. this, these enslaved families were an interconnected network, so it's like, oh, Guilford, you know, I'm just a pioneer. Let's say Guilford had a gambling problem. Mm -hmm. which is why the debt went unpaid and and so if you are in the house or you overhear something you know you, you could even be a plantation or a neighbor enslaved by a neighbor you hear okay auction is coming up or if you find someone who's in the community who can read and write they would see it in the newspaper or they'd be able to identify because remember you have to post the notice for a certain right. number of days before the auction takes place so it's like oh Guilford stuff is about to go up okay, you know, how many days do we have? You know, you have to have the notice and in, in up for a certain amount of time. So that's sort of buying time. But, you know, then, then I mean, there's a number of things. It's run away. It's waited out. It's maybe we can buy our freedom if you're in a state where they legally allow enslaved people to hire themselves out and keep the profits for themselves. I mean, you know, again, we're here in 2022 and I'm over here going through all the things, right? Like, you know, if me and Shelly were there together, it's like, okay, we, I already know me and Shelly were there. <laughs> Um, I already know. I already know. I would have been like, "You can make it. You can make it." Like, you know, I'd be talking. Oh, girl, let's go. <laughs> you know, I think I think, I think one of the the most touching things of well, well, you 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 found family. You were able to connect the family, but then you were able to take them. You went on that journey back to Virginia, and stand at that courthouse, and it was. I think that was one of the most touching moments of the film. Um, the reaction, I mean, the reaction of, of them reading the letter was, was yeah, something. that was tough Just, too. That, that wow, every, and she'd read a line and go, wow, <laughs> read a letter and go, wow, you know, how much it was touching her, but to be able to take her to the beach, take them both to the beach, you know, in Galveston, yeah. and then take them back to Virginia and, you know, and, and also to the property, the land. Um, to be where they used to be. And, and that's one thing that we love to do as genealogists is to go back to where our ancestors walked and touch things that they may have touched and, and imagine, you know, maybe that tree was there when they were there. But to stand right, on those right. steps was just, that was real emotional because that's where he was sold off. And that's, you know, oh, that was, can you talk a little bit about that day? Right. Well, and that's the thing. I don't think folks realize that is the same courthouse. I saw you tearing up in there. Just so you know. Right. Like, like in HD, because everyone's like, I don't know how you cry. If you watch it in HD, you don't see. I it's, it's, I had, right. It was stuff up here. And then, you know, it may have been in between takes where I had to actually wipe it. 
But, yeah. I, but yeah, oh yeah, no. It, it's impossible not to be emotional no. listening to the yeah. story, you know, especially when you have children or grandchildren that are the same age that this man was when all of this stuff happened. You immediately mm-hmm. place those who you love in the, that position and just think about what if that was fill in right. the blank. Um, but but that courthouse is the exact same mm-hmm. courthouse. It's wow. the same one. They just whitewash the outside. The inside, I will tell you, that is probably one of the best, um, you know, where they kept the outside. That's one of the best renovations I've ever seen on an, on a, on an old courthouse. It mm. was excellent. Like, I was walking around like going, whoa. <laughs> like, I said, oh, okay, man. Like literally, <laughs> like the outside, it stayed the same, but the inside was modern. It was modern, and I, I again, I was expected to smell. You know how it is. I was born yes, with linoleum. Yes, you know, yes. I, I just, I, I had, a, I had it all in my head. Nope, nope. It was completely modernized on the inside. Um, and so yeah, that was the exact courthouse. Um, and and that moment, um it's just very hard to put into words because mm-hmm. it's different. It's different when you're reading about a slave. Mm-hmm. It's different when you're reading about your ancestor, yes. you know, um, yes. right. Your family, there were people milling about going and handling business, paying for the car mm-hmm. tags, you know, people mm-hmm. just going, walking by that same spot, not even realizing Knowing. that mm-hmm. Hawkins was, was sold there. But so many other enslaved people awesome. were, were sold in that same spot. You know, folks, folks just don't even, they don't even realize that the other thing is there was a, like a, uh, like an information hut, you know, like, you know, like where you can pin up signs and stuff mm-hmm. that was in that space. And there was, there used to be a Confederate monument there, but they moved it. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. You know, it's all of these things, you know, yes. it's so yes. thinking timely. Like, it's just, yeah. you know, it just, I can just think like there's that state I'm standing right next to that would have potentially been a monument, but it wasn't when we were there. They had moved it. Yeah. yeah. So it's, again, there are all these remnants of this time that mm-hmm. are all around us that people yeah. think, oh, that was so long ago and nobody knows, no, you know, there, you, you don't see that anymore. There's no connection to that. But we're walking by these things every single day. Mm-hmm. And we don't, it's not even on our radar. We don't even know it. It, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. I have to tell you one other thing. When you, um, this is, I, I have to tell you this for my 18 year old who watched it with me last night. She wanted me to tell you this. Um, so when you were able to, the cousins got to meet at the end and you had the two different lines meet and they came, they started talking to each other and you just went off to yes. the side into the background and and pulled yourself out of the story and let them be the story she said that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen how she just knew that she just needed to you know let them have their time and their moment so I just wanted to let you know that an 18 year old realized what was going on and she really appreciated that right too. right it was yeah beautiful. No, thank you. please please tell her please tell her thank you uh so thank you for that and again I'm just the vessel by which that got them there like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Someone, someone, uh, my best friend had me dying laughing, but I totally saw it after she said it. She's like, you know, you're like Della Reese and Touched by an Angel. <laughs> yes! Yes! Uh-huh. That's it! Yeah. That's it! And, Hello. Right, <laughs> right, and I was dying because I was like, okay, that's like one of those shows that like moms over a certain age watch, <laughs> like in the heat of the night, you know, for like a dad, right? Like it's, and I just, I, now I can't unsee it. Like I was, she's like, she's like, it's not bad. You were totally like Delores, <laughs> totally Delores and took my name. So, and I was like, well, that's good. I love Delores, you know, I but, but yeah. that's right. Like you just, you, again, it's mm-hmm. their story, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I'm but one, you know, you, it, 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 here it is, you know, um, for, for folks that take clients, right? There's right. a certain point in time where when you deliver the information or you mm-hmm. make your attempt to ask, answer a question for someone, you have to know when to back up and allow right. them to process. Because right. those of us that are genealogists, we want to stick folks at the buffet. People might not want the buffet. <laughs> they might only want to, they may well only want an appetizer, but we want to <laughs> give them golden corral. <laughs> and they can't handle that much information. It's too much. Do you have to really be like 
deliberate True. and like you know what I mean like you it's not so much yeah. like stringing it out it's just it's so much and we we just forget we pack all of this stuff you know it's like it's like the shelves sitting behind Melissa it's all of our brain <laughs> and then and then we want everybody to take all of those books and and read them all when they only can handle a paragraph in right. one of them and on one page so true so I said, uh-huh. oh, right so yeah. I say all that to say you gotta know you know what I mean you have to know when it's time to you know again to allow them their moment and the other thing is there's a there was a that was that was what a hundred plus years of yeah. waiting yeah not necessarily for them specifically but you just have to think about the individuals that they're bringing with them their ancestors that was that was a hundred plus years of waiting for that yeah. moment so no heck no I wasn't supposed to stay there that long <laughs> but at the end of the day you know I kind of feel inherited by like Hawkins you know yeah. like even though he's he's not my ancestor like he's you know he's my oh, yeah. ancestor you know oh, what yeah. I mean sort of you're so connected now oh right. yeah Oh yeah, you're right. connected. Now, right. Melissa, were you gonna say something? No, I'm good. I'm just listening to her talk. It was great. Oh, okay. I, I love I the thought... story. I yeah. do. I guess I do have a question yeah. now. Um, I saw that uh, Henry Louis Gates was in there, yes. uh, and the actor, which I cannot remember his name, uh, Anthony, how did... Anthony Anderson. Anthony and Anderson. yes, thank you. Um, I, um, how did they end up coming on board? So with those two, um, Dr. Gates has you know he's had a long-standing relationship with ancestry mm-hmm. so naturally you know for a movie where we're talking about the subject matter you know um that's that's of course why he's been engaged i thought i loved him the animation of him like yeah. just his the way that he reacted yes. that was like love like i hold your phone um and with with anthony he's the every man he's the non-genealogist yes the person who is not tracing their tree might have an interest in you know in history you know that that sort of voice that comes in like that yes. um you know or even like if you're thinking about like a family family gathering yeah. you know the individual who kind of stops by the table everybody's talking maybe every 20 or 30 minutes <laughs> and gets one little more so and like yeah. <laughs> like you know we we have we have all three of us or the iterations of us in our own families yeah. and so you know, we all have specific roles that that we fit in the story, and you know, it just it just came together in that way. And right. you know, that's the other thing that that we also have to realize is that there is a crew of people who put this together who mm-hmm. are not genealogists. Right. And and one of the things that I absolutely loved was they were so, like literally you could not you could not pick a better group of people. But what I noticed happening as the days went on is they started asking questions uh-huh. about their own family histories oh, good. and started wondering about this or about that or just, you know, just events and things that happened. And it was it was it was awesome. Like they, you know, started trees and like went did DNA testing. And one of the people I like met with them last week and I was like, oh, we got you. Like I was like so excited because <laughs> you know, they just. Some of it was, some of it was just permission. Like, it's okay to, you know, it's okay to ask the questions and like seek the information out. And and I loved that part. Like, that was, oh my gosh, I live for that. Like, you know, you guys know, like when you get a newbie and they like, get it? Yes. (laughs) Right. It It just, it would just. It would just so happen to be the sound guy That's or, great. you know, the, the director of photography, which was, which was great. So they're all like super duper, like checked in. And, um, and for me, that part, especially the creative part and being mm-hmm. able to like forge relationships with those folks, you know, from that aspect of my life, that was, yeah. Like we're all still texting and like, oh, so you know, great. talking and stuff. So that was, that was another like added plus to all mm-hmm. of this too. Laura, you said you have another question? Yeah. Nick, I was just wondering if you wanted to speak a little bit to the title of A Dream Delivered, which is kind of a not just Hawkins dream and maybe connect it with your dream, et cetera. Yeah. So the title is definitely, I would have to ask Dio because I'm pretty sure he's the one that (laughs) came up with this. But I believe it's a play on A Dream Deferred, which Mm -hmm. is a poem. Um, and instead of it being a dream deferred, it's a dream delivered. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's probably what it was because it, and it plus the thing is the letter never got to where it was supposed yes. to go. Didn't get, it wasn't officially delivered. 
so you know then it goes back to the lost letters like that's like the you know like the second part of the title mm -hmm. um and yeah i mean and for for me personally you know i've been i this is something i mean it definitely is a dream for me to be able to tell these kinds of stories um, you know, one of the things that I notice so often when shows come out and things like that is just the everyday person. It's like, I wish they would do this for regular people. Exactly. You know, and like, <laughs> and, and in fact, in fact, I saw someone comment on the film that they wish they would do this for regular people, and I'm like, they are regular people. <laughs> <laughs> they are. I think it was the uh, Anderson <laughs> and the Gates that that some right, people thought. some people thought, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm like, they are regular people. Like, I'm like, you can't get any more regular than Miss Brie and Kelly. He like, did do one regular lady. You remember that in his did. series? He did do one reg. I'm going to say regular lady. One person that was not a movie star or actor or something. And that was early back when he did Quincy Jones, Oprah. You're talking and, about African American uh, Jameson, There was a lady that was not a movie star and and on one of the episodes i want to say it might have been the african-american lies series it was african-american lives and there right. was some lady that got selected and they researched her ancestry mm. so i, I want to make a comment about sure. the film and and you were explaining this to the the cousins the relatives that and and I'm saying this as a tip for people to realize, and you made it clear that African Americans who were enslaved or even free were at the mercy of those enumerators and others. And so when we're coming through, we got different identifiers for folks, you know, on either the color of their skin, there's different titles, there's different abbreviations. But but I say thank you to that because that's something people need to understand. The research, it takes time, but understand it's a lot of that is some interpretation that someone's sitting on one side of the table talking about somebody else and they have no clue. And, and right. you know, and I think that was such an important fact for me as a researcher to understand that our ancestors, there's a lot of assumptions on those census, census records. So true. Yeah. So true. And so that, that I thank you for that. And again, that shows the experience also that you have because you're dealing with that as well. Mm -hmm. So that was another right. thing. Yeah. Well, Anika, what what do you hope comes from this? It, it wasn't released very long ago. What is the outcome that you're hoping for with this film? Well, I think number one, you know, I just really hope that it it pushes folks to to start looking into their family history. I think the pandemic has really, really galvanized a lot of people who, you know, were just putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and then just decided, okay, like this is probably the best time for me to start this. And I think for us as genealogists and people who've been in this space, we clearly have seen a bunch of new people like jump in like over the last two years, which is great. So I hope it definitely continues that. Um, I would say second, I really, I really hope that it presses the point home for people who descend from formerly enslaved people that they can trace them mm -hmm. and that they can find them in records. And not only that, but also that the Freedmen's Bureau is not just a collection of records for the formerly enslaved, that mm -hmm. there were people who worked at the Bureau, there were people who leased land, um, who were not Southerners and who were not slaveholders, you know, mm -hmm. that that people, again, who, who weren't in any enslaved roles at all, right, on either end of it, that they're documenting the collection as well, right. and that if we don't think about it, from that vantage point, people could be missing their ancestors and incredible stories of them helping to usher in one of the most important eras of civil rights for Black people in America. Mm -hmm. If you overlook that, right, again, you're working in the Bureau, you're helping people get married, you know, be paid for their wages for once, um, uh -huh. you know, be able to, to, to complain if, if, uh, if uh, their, their employer is not treating them well or, or if, if violence has been enacted against them. Um, you know, in the community, all of those things, like if you had an ancestor who was involved in, in pr protecting those folks, that's a story you should want to tell. Yes. Um, and so we can't, you know what I mean? So we can't overlook that. 
Um, and I just, I just really hope we, we take, I, to me, I consider this to be sort of the next step after um, Roots, right? Roots is, can you trace back to Africa? This is, can we find the people who survived this, the, the incident? Right, like, can we can we find it? Can we find the people who lived to see freedom, who mm -hmm. who were alive for the Thirteenth Amendment? That's oh, yeah. that's what yeah. this is. And many people don't think beyond. Can I trace before nineteen hundred? Mm -hmm. They don't even get mm -hmm. that far. Right. So so that I hope is is something else that that people also um, get from the film. And I'm and I'm hearing from a lot of genies. We want this to be a series. So <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah, that would be great. Right. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. You know, I'm sending <laughs> everyone, I'm like, hey, go to social media, write your comments, <laughs> you know, thumbs up things if you want that. Um, because, you know, as we were filming it, like, again, like, this, again, everyone who's there who's not a genealogist is like, oh my gosh, are there more stories like this? I'm like, there are thousands. Like, what, what, what do you want? You know, and they're like, wow. So again, we know there is, we, Shelly knows there is no shortage of story. It yeah. literally, every week on Fridays, we are delving into the yes. record. There's and, always and it is a not connection just, made. Always. Right. No. Always. It just always. doesn't even, let us even, down. Wait, what, what was the guy's name last week? Shelly, Hosea Vidal? Yeah. There no. was, there was a, another 100-year-old man that I found. Yeah. Getting rations in Louisiana. And found him on the 1870 census. So I actually found him in the right. census and then on those rations. And it didn't even take me very long. So then it's like, oh my gosh, like he's a hundred. Like, what did he <laughs> live through? You know, and then when we started looking up, you know, where would Vidal come from and the parish that he was in? And the fact that that was like one of the early settlers to um, Spanish um, Mississippi. And like, yeah. I mean, that's, it, the, the Freedmen's Bureau is like, it's like linen, it's like a hem on linen pants. <laughs> I like that. Where if you have like just one thread and you're like, oh, I'll just pull it. I won't cut it. And and that one little thing just keeps yeah. going on and on and on and on. You know, um, I think I said last week, it, it's a honeymoon record collection. Mm -hmm. Not from the vantage point of like, you're going to find honeymoons because you will find honeymoons in there. But... <laughs> It's yeah. from the vantage point of, it's like, you know, if you've been married for a long time, you know, you've been married for a long time, you need, you know, you got to have a little spice every once in a while, right? <laughs> you got you to gotta keep things lively. So the Freeman's Bureau comes through with flowers, <laughs> chocolate, foot <laughs> rubs, right when you think, am I lying to Shelly? Right, right when you think it's like, oh, this can't get... We've been, we've been together for a long time. You can't and imagine the conversations that go on. We will we will put the link. We'll put the link on that if anybody's interested in joining you for your Freedman, Freedman's Friday. Oh, yeah. It's um, open. To, there's people from yep. the, all across. Yep. Wherever yep. We'll put the, the, we'll put the link in the, in, in the blog post. Yeah. And on the, yeah. Yeah. But, we'll do that. You know, another point to that is we have sat there and there'd be 20, 30 people in the room. And all of a sudden. That's my, that's, oh, that, that's my person. That, that gives me chills. That just gives me yeah, chills. Yeah, that, that, wait a minute, you know. Yeah, and no. of course, they ragged me big time last Friday. No, Nika did, talking about I always go to Virginia first. Well, I am not going to be implicated. Do so not I implicate me. She, it's because, it's because, Virginia because I, it's in there. I am making the point that I feel as though there's a segment of genealogy and when it comes to enslaved people that is very upper south centric meaning mm -hmm. virginia the carolinas mm -hmm. you know maryland right like those of us that you know came way past the base of dixon you know that <laughs> downward sh shift shift of enslaved people where we are like mississippi louisiana right. texas arkansas like folk, we are like the land of the misfit toys sometimes when it comes to genealogy, you know. And we're and here we are, like longing to get back to these places because we all tie back there. Yeah, absolutely. Or sometimes our sometimes our African enslaved ancestors ancestors didn't come through Charleston or yeah, or Virginia. They came through New Orleans. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. They came the other way around. So yeah, that's why she's saying I'm picking on her. <laughs> Just to, well, this is know. this has been so much fun. Does anybody else have a question or Nika? Is there something that we have not asked you that you wish we would have? Just to make sure we we cover. Um, the- if we had an hour in this film, we could actually talk about what Hawkins did after he was sold. You know, oh, like after man. he was in Texas. Yeah. Because we, we didn't get the rest we, of the story. We didn't have right that was mm-hmm. right. We didn't get to that. Um, yeah. you know, we, yeah. we talked we'll about do a part two. Right. We'll have to do a part two. Yeah, absolutely. Do right, a part right. Two. We didn't get to Cirilla yeah. and you know his wife Martha and I mean wow. you know there there was his life like after yeah. afterwards was just we'll as. I have to tell ancestry. We I all mean, want yeah. the part two now. You you've got <laughs> us hooked, and now we At want least part two. Finish it. Yeah, we've, you've got to. And and for anybody that's wondering where to watch this, it is on the Ancestry homepage. You yeah. just scroll down. Mm-hmm. And again, it's called A Dream Delivered. I want to make sure I say it correctly. The Lost Letters of Hawkins Wilson. And it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful film. So go to Ancestry, scroll down. You'll see the link, click on it and watch it. And it's just, it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful and touching. And 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 like we said, we, we want more. We want more. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, and joining with Ancestry to do this. And and there's a need. There is absolute a need for this. And so I'm hoping that there will be more. So thank uh-huh. you so much for coming and joining us. And, and with that, we will see you next time on Gen Friends. Bye, everybody. Bye.